One of my favorite stories about total commitment, total surrender, is this. A chicken and a pig were walking down the road one day, an old country road, and the chicken looked over to the pig and said, oh boy, am I ever getting hungry. And the pig said, so am I, chicken. Ever since we started this walk, I've been hungry. And the chicken said, what do you say we stop at the next restaurant we see and get something to eat? And the pig said, that's a great idea. So as they rose over the next knoll of the country road, they noticed at a distance a restaurant with a sign. And the sign said, ham and eggs, 250. The chicken said, wow, that really looks great. Why don't we stop there and eat? And the pig said, of course you would want to eat there. And the chicken said, what do you mean? Ham and eggs, 250? What's wrong with that? And the pig said, well, for you, that's just a contribution. For me, <laughs> that's a total commitment. When we look at the word sacrifice, we need to consider that as a full commitment, a giving of something we need to meet the needs of someone else, that somebody else has, that we consider that person as greater value and that their needs to be greater than our own. Whenever we sacrifice, now you remember the Old Covenant Scriptures had a system of giving. They were commanded by God to give the tenth of all that they had that the first fruits from their harvest, from their animals, from all of their wealth, the first fruit, the best, the first tenth of all that they had was to be given to God. It supported the priesthood and the temple work. It was sort of like a theocracy tax by God. And it was a sense of sacrifice because you see, they needed that harvest and those animals and that wealth in order to survive. But they gave the first tenth, the best of what they had. The firstborn was to be devoted and given to God. The firstborn male animal, the firstborn male son was devoted to God as an heir of God, as a gift to God, as a blessing to God. These were old covenant commands to Israel to train Israel to be a nation that was sacrificial, that would learn to give first to the needs of others. Well, they didn't learn very well. In the new covenant, God wants his people to be sacrificial as well. Now, he did not command, as far as I can tell, nowhere in the New Covenant Scriptures does God command the Christian to give a tenth, the first tenth, the best tenth. But you see, the principle of Old Covenant Scripture, which, by the way, that was the Bible of the New Testament church. You do realize that the New Testament that we hold, the books, the 27 books that we call the New Testament, they were living while those were being written. And, and these were not collected in one form of 27 books we call the New Testament until about 120 to 150, maybe 180 AD. That's right, about 100 years after the resurrection of Jesus. The New Testament canon, the 27 books, were collected as a whole collection of books. So... What Bible did the early church use? Well, they, the, what they called the Holy Scriptures of God are the Old Covenant Scriptures. From there, they learned the principles of how to live as God's people. Whether they had Jewish background or non-Jewish background, theirs is the heritage of faith that came from the time of Abraham, even before, the principles of living with, in relationship with God. So God had taught them, his people, both in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, to live sacrificial lives. And by definition, sacrifice is not just giving the extra and abundance of what you have, or out of the extra and abundance of what you have, but what you need, what you earn and you need to survive, God says, the first belongs to me. We don't do that then begrudgingly, nor do we set it as a tenth, but rather we set from our heart what we're going to give to God. And it's more than just on Sunday morning when the plate comes by in a church assembly. No, he's calling us to a life of giving.
Now we begin with sacrifices and then offerings and gifts. Those are the extras beyond what is expected of us to give. You find in the early church, whenever people were facing a famine and they were starving to death, that the Gentile, the non-Jewish churches, sent money to help the Christians in Jerusalem, in the Palestinian region. In fact, one church was commended for giving out of their poverty more than they were able to. And Paul said, no, 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 you don't need to do this. And the, the people of Macedonia said, no, we want to. We want to help them. Please, Paul, take this gift too. They begged that Paul would take more money than they were able to give themselves. It was a sacrifice for them. But Paul says the reason they did that was because they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us. <laughs> I see something there that maybe is going to be beneficial for us as we study this idea of sacrifice. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 12. But before we do, Hebrews chapter 12, the first three verses or four, I want you to notice this. Our model, Jesus, lived what he called us to live. He came as the temple of God, the fullness of God himself on earth. He fills his people. We are the fullness of God on this earth. He who fills all in all. The body of Christ, which was the temple of God when he was here physically, and is the temple of God because that's, that's what the church is. We are the body of Christ. And Ephesians chapter 1 says we are the, his body, the fullness of him who fills all things in all ways. That's right. Jesus was the fullness of God on this earth. And look, the church is the fullness of God on this earth, acting as God would act in this world. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit of God. We are priests. Now, Jesus came as the ultimate high priest to offer in his temple the ultimate sacrifice himself. But we, as the body of Christ in our own physical bodies, we're called the sanctuary, the holy of holies of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, 19, 20 says that, don't you know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? You've been bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Our bodies, our physical bodies, the presence of the fullness of God in the world so that everywhere you go, because King Jesus is living in you, the kingdom of God has just arrived. And that's important news. You are the temple of God, you are a priest of God, and you have sacrifices to offer God. This is a two-part message, and I want to, to make this a two-part message this way. First of all, to understand what the fullness of the word sacrifice means. And second of all, to show how that works its way out as we follow Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice. But first, let's understand what sacrifice is meaning. It is the giving up of something you need in order to benefit others in their needs. Not just their desires, but their needs. We give what we need to help others in their needs. That's sacrifice. Our model, Jesus, did that. Now you understand when he died, he had to die. Now, the animal sacrifices of the Old Testament scriptures were given so that the life of the innocent would take the life of the guilty. But we're instructed in Hebrews chapter 10 that the life of an animal could never take the place of a life of a person. Why? Because animals don't have the same value as a person. So the innocent could die for the guilty and take the place of the guilty. That's a beautiful picture of death suffered by an innocent to set free that the guilty could live if the offering, if the sacrifice was given by faith. And you know, once a year, the high priest of God would take the goat, the blood of the goat into the Holy of Holies through the veil. He was the only one allowed to do that. He would take the blood, the life of the goat that had just been, the sins of the people had been placed in that goat. Symbolically, I understand, spiritually, it happened. But you see, the goat 
How could the goat take the place of a person? <laughs> How could the goat take the place of an entire nation? But that's what, that's what God had commanded. So they took the, the knife and slit the throat of the goat. They took the blood. The high priest of God went into the Holy of Holies, into the very presence of God, and took that blood and sprinkled it over the mercy seat, which covered the law that the people had broken. So the blood, the sacrifice, was covering so that the mercy of God would cover the law that the people had broken. We needed that, we need that desperately. But again, how can the life of an animal take the life of a, the, 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 the place of a person? Impossible. No life of an animal. All of the animals put together doesn't even equal the value of one human being because we're created in the image of God. We have a greater value than all of the animal kingdom combined. You could kill all of the animals to take the place of a human being and it still wouldn't be enough. But because it was offered by faith, it the ultimate sacrifice. Because as far as God was concerned, when did Jesus die? In Jerusalem? When he physically lived? No, the scripture says, before the foundation of the world, in the mind of God, Christ died. That's the most important. Because you see, God is above time. So the death of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, what has always been to God, reality. So that when those animals were sacrificed by faith, God looked through the blood of his son, through the blood and the trust of those people offering the animal, and counted those people not guilty. He forgave them. The Bible says they were forgiven. I'm just telling you how I believe it happened. It is always through the death of Jesus and the faith of the person. They offered the animal by faith, obeying the law of God, trusting that God would somehow take the innocent animal's life in place of his or her own life. Because you see, our sin separates us from God. Then we will live forever. No, Adam and Eve's sin saw to it that we would all die physically. But we all die spiritually, separated from God forever because of our own sin. And if Jesus did not come into this world and offer his own body as the ultimate sacrifice, we don't have any chance of a relationship with God. There is no other way. I know that's true because Jesus prayed, if there is another way, take this cup away from me. But if there's not another way, your will be done, not my will. God either said, well, there is another way, but I'm gonna make you suffer anyway. Or God said, there is no other way. You have to die. And so Jesus chose to voluntarily give himself, the only innocent human being who has ever lived a full life, voluntarily gave himself. But how could the life of one man take the life of more than one man? It's a life for life. See, this, the scripture says, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a life for a life. An innocent animal's life takes, a, takes the place of a guilty person. How can the life of one man take the sin of more than one person, unless that one man is worth all of us combined and then some. God himself in the body of Jesus, fully human, fully God, physically dead on a cross, our sins in his body because he voluntarily accepted them. See, the, the animal didn't voluntarily die. We killed it. Jesus gave his life. In fact, he said, nobody takes my life from me, but I've been given authority to lay down my life and I've been given authority to take it up again. He chose, he chose to die for us, the ultimate sacrifice. What's most important for us to understand is this, his motivation. In Hebrews chapter 12, we're given the key to overcoming sin and we're also given the model for how to live a sacrificial life. Watch. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, 
What's he talking about? Well, he's talking about all those people listed in the 11th page of this book, this letter. He's talking about all of those people who lived by faith and had such great results or who suffered great losses, even their own lives. Some of them cut in half, some stoned to death. They lived in caves, but they endured all of their hardships through trusting God. They succeeded in all of the great blessings and in receiving the great blessings through trust in God. So we're called to walk like them. No, we're called to take a step above. See, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. They, they've testified to, they have testified to the faithfulness and the power and the assurance of God himself. They've testified to that. We're surrounded by their testimonies. And now we're called to do something even greater. So let us also lay aside every weight, hmm, every weight, anxiety, every connection we have on this earth that would hold us to this earth. That might be a house. It might be a car, it might be a job, it might be our money, it may be our people, our family. Whatever it is that is the weight that would hold us here, lay it aside in your own mind, in your own heart. What's more important to you, your relationship with God or those things and those people? No, it is God himself and you will sacrifice all for him. Lay it aside, every weight and sin which so easily clings to us, so closely clings to us. Lay it aside. See, any temporary pleasure or release of anxiety through a choice of disobedience to God or any act of not obeying God so that we don't have trouble with other people, we just don't do it so that Others won't think less of us or take things away from us or maybe we'll lose our own job if they see that our Bible is sitting on our desk or we happen to read it during, during lunch or we're talking to somebody else at work about Jesus or at school about Jesus. No, sin, the absence of doing the will of God or the clear disobedience to God, the Hebrew writer says, lay it aside. It's not worth it. What do you mean it's not worth it? Well, I mean this. Let's run with endurance the race that is set before us. Run with endurance. Don't give up. Don't look back. The people who are running a race are always looking ahead. They're always running ahead. If you run and you look behind you while you're running, you're not going to run very long. You can't keep on running forward if you're looking backward. Don't look at what you gave up. Keep on looking at what's ahead of you. Well, what is ahead of you? Ah, I'm glad you asked. Verse 2. Looking to, or literally, fixing your eyes, that word in the Greek, hooking. I see a fish hook, hooking into Jesus and the line hooking into our eyes, and it keeps our eyes fixed on him, hooked on Jesus. Watch, looking, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the founder and perfecter. Another translation says, more accurately probably, the author and pioneer of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of God on the throne of God, on the right hand of the throne of God. We keep on, that word is continually fixing our eyes on Jesus. What are you doing? You're running a race. You're going to keep on running and not give up. See, it's a marathon, not a dash. It's a long term. Run with endurance. You want to keep on running and keep your eyes on him, fixed on him. Don't look back. Don't be caught with your eyes back behind you. You'd be like the man who put both hands on the plow and kept looking back. Jesus said, you're not fit for the kingdom if you're going to live that way. You need to keep looking ahead. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Keep on fixing your eyes on Jesus. How do you do that? Well, you read the Gospels. You talk about him. You tell others about what you're learning about Jesus. 
You share the message of good news, the death, the resurrection of Jesus, the burial of Jesus, how our sins have been dealt with, and how Jesus has been raised to be king of his kingdom. Jesus came proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. We proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God in that our king died for us, was buried, was raised again, and now is Lord king of all. We surrendered ourselves to the king. We were dead with him. We were buried with him in baptism. We were raised together with him to live a new life so that he would be the king of our lives, the Lord of all. We surrendered it all. We were like the pig who said, for me, that's a total commitment. And that's what it's about. But you see, total commitment, we look at it wrongly. Total commitment is like, it's like a marriage. It's like a marriage between two people who stood before the minister or the judge or whoever was officiating the wedding, and the man, woman, officiating the wedding says to the man, will you give her all that you are, all that you have, all that you ever will be? And he says, I will. I give her all that I am, all that I have, all that I ever will be. And she looks to him and says, That's, that sounds really good. I'll give you half. <laughs> you, know, you know that's not true, right? Because an effective, successful, true marriage is 100% commitment, 100% commitment. I see the cross as 100% commitment. How about you? Don't you see Jesus at the cross saying to you and to me as he takes all of our sins into himself, dies for our sins, is raised from the dead, Jesus says, I give to you all that I am, all that I ever will be, all that I have, it's yours. In order for me to have that kind of relationship with him, I have to respond with an equal degree of commitment of surrender, of sacrifice. My sacrifice, my sacrificial life begins with my sacrifice to him. Jesus, because you gave me all that you are and all that you have, I give you all that I am, all that I have, all that I ever will be. And on that basis, relationship with Christ can be formed. You don't take all that Jesus has, all that Jesus is, and give him half. It is 100% by him and 100% in effort, in attitude, in heart, by you. Are you gonna be able to perfectly live that out? I don't know anybody who has, Maybe it's theoretically possible, but I don't think it, it, it's, it's real. I think we're all going to fall in the same way that in marriage we have continual need for forgiveness. But you see, Jesus never failed. He never fell, and he never will. He is perfect. Fortunately, his sacrifice makes us perfect so that even when we have fallen or ever will fall, we keep holding his hand in commitment and surrender, and he continues to forgive. First John chapter one teaches that. Chapter two says, even if we should sin, happen to sin, we have an advocate who argues our case before God. Jesus doesn't say, well, we need to overlook that sin because it was so heavy, so, so tempting for him. He had such great desire, he was so weak. No, none of those excuses. Jesus says, I paid for that sin, and he trusts me. Father, forgive him. And God says, I forgive him based on your sacrifice for his life. We have an advocate who argues our case because he was the, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, he's the propitiation, the sacrifice that takes the heat off of us. We follow the one who 
sacrificed everything so we would have relationship with God. So our first application is this. What will we sacrifice joyfully looking through our own crosses, through our cross walk with Jesus? If anyone comes after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. From the cross of Jesus, from my own cross, I look through and who for the joy set before him endured the cross, the pain of the cross, the double pain, the pain of the physical death and the pain of the spiritual death that Jesus suffered when he took our sins and he died not just for my sin, but as if he were the one who committed my sin. He died as if he were the one who committed your sin and all the sins, the murder, the rape, the child trafficking, the greed, all of the sin in his own body. He died for our sin and died as if he were the one who committed our sin. And so because of that, he was separated from God for us. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you left me? It's because of our sin in his body that he voluntarily took. He endured the cross, the pain, the double pain, the physical pain, excruciating, the spiritual pain, unbearable, except by the powerful Son of God who in humility and weakness trusted God. He entrusted himself to him because despising the shame for the joy, the joy set before him. I think Jesus looked through his own cross and he saw you. He saw you loving him. He saw you responding to him. He saw you choosing to live with him as your Lord, as his, as your Lord, that he would be the king of your heart, that he would transform you into the blessing into the world, that he would bring the message of good news like he lived and he taught you would live and you would teach all of us as members of the body of Christ living as Jesus lived and lives in us. He looked through the cross, endured the pain, despising the shame because of the joy. And as he said in John chapter 15, greater love has no one than this. Nobody can love anybody more than this, that he should die for his friends, that he would lay down his life for his friends. And you are my friend. A friend of Jesus. Is there any better message? Is there any better set of words? Doesn't that sound beautiful to you? A friend a best friend. He is my best friend. <laughs> but Jesus, Jesus said that I am his friend. You remember that was a name that was given to Abraham? Abraham was a friend of God. We're descendants of Abraham in that we have the same faith as him and he, Jesus, the seed of Abraham, we are in him. All of us that were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. We're in him, Galatians chapter 3, verse 27 says. And so we are heirs of Christ, joint heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. We are the heirs of Abraham himself. We are the seed of Abraham because we're in the seed of Abraham, Jesus. This is, this is deep, but I want you to hear carefully what I mean. Abraham was called initially by God to receive blessings from God to be a blessing to the world. Through your seed, I will bless all nations. And Jesus is the seed, the descendant of Abraham who blesses all nations. But before God said that, he said, Abraham, I will bless you. Blessing you, I will bless you. Which is in Hebrew of way of saying, I'm gonna really bless you, Abraham. I'm gonna so fill your life with blessings, it's gonna be so wonderful to be you. And through you, 
I'm going to produce a seed that will bless all nations. You will be the blessing of all nations and you'll become the father of many nations. We are descendants of Abraham if we've chosen to live by faith in Jesus. You say, I'm physically not a Jew. That's not what that says. You are spiritually a Jew because the heart of Judaism is the temple of God, the priesthood of God, the sacrifice of God, and at the heart of it all is the law of God. Jesus came and he lived the law of God perfectly. He was the temple of God, the priest of God who offered his own body as sacrifice, his own life as sacrifice to God, so that the law, the perfect law of God, would be fulfilled. Now you and I step into the fulfillment of the law of, the, of God as the temple of God, the priest of God, offering ourselves as sacrifices to God. Next week, the next lesson rather that I teach will be focused on how to live that life out in the world and give ourselves up for others. But right now we need to learn what it means for us to be a sacrifice, giving everything we are and everything we have to God. He owns it all because we gave it all. Why did we give it all? Because he first gave it all for us. We love, we consider him valuable, and we commit to him because he first loved us. He so valued you, and he's committed to you, to your best, a friend of Jesus. Lord, thank you that you call us your friend. Thank you that you made us your friend because you died for our sins. Thank you that you sacrificed yourself for us on that cross, taking all of our sin into your body and nailing it, and then offering your very blood, your life for our life. That by you taking our sin, you offer to us your righteousness. Thank you. Help us to now live out what you have put in to our lives. Help us to understand more fully what it means for us to be a living sacrifice. First of all, sacrificing ourselves to you. Second of all, sacrificing ourselves for others. And it's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen.